senior lecturer at uh, the Sydney Medical School of the University of Sydney. Uh, Dr. Lampy, welcome to us, Indian. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thanks for agreeing to talk to us. And uh, of course, uh, uh, first up, if we can get a definition of what is mental illness. Okay. Um, mental illness is variously defined. There's 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 research criteria which define um, exactly what symptoms and signs a person needs to have. But I think it's best thought of as existing on a spectrum. So, for example, all of us at some time in our life may have anxiety. We may experience being a bit low in our mood, and if those symptoms become severe, they become sustained, as in they persist for weeks or longer mm. and they don't go away. And if they start to interfere in our ability to live a normal life, to enjoy our relationships, to work, to fulfil our social roles, then they may have reached a level of severity that becomes an illness. So that can happen because as I say, kind of normal emotions such as anxiety or low mood become severe. Or with certain types of mental illness, people experience symptoms that really are completely out of ordinary experience, such as hearing things like hearing voices or, or seeing things or having quite unusual experiences. So is it fair to say that uh, mental illness doesn't allow someone to perform their day-to-day -day life normally? Mental illness pretty much by definition interferes with functioning. It might interfere a little bit or it might interfere a lot. Right. And uh, of course, doctor, there isn't a blood test or an x-ray or a MRI or a CT scan we can do to find out. How do we diagnose mental illness? You're right. It, ma it makes it very difficult because we can't do a test to either give us a definite diagnosis or, in fact, to inform us about the best treatment. So mental illness is diagnosed by talking to people. Mm. So it's very important to hear the person's experiences, what's been happening. It can be extremely useful to have the observations of people who are close to them to explain what they've observed. Right. And so what we then use is we, we listen to the person's description of their experiences, their symptoms. We ask them some questions. We then match that against patterns that have been recognised that guide us as to what specific mental disorder or mental illness a person might have. So mm. we, we try and match, if you like, the patterns. And, and then really, I guess we have to work with the person over time, perhaps try some treatments to, I guess, develop more certainty over the diagnosis. Mm. Sometimes it'll be quite clear. It's a very clear cut case of depression, say, or anxiety. But many times, individuals being individual, yes. it can be very complex mm. and, and not that easy to work out what's going on. Mm. We know that uh, it is a serious problem here in Australia. How widespread do you think that it is in Australia? Well, I think it's much more widespread than people realise. Mm. Yes. Um, in fact, the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, which was a, a household survey of Australian adults uh, over 16, identified that in a person's lifetime, nearly 50% of people would have experienced symptoms that at the time would have met criteria for a mental illness. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't all have been severe and in many cases the symptoms just settled on their own. So it is very common and what we know is that in any 12 month period about one in five Australians would meet criteria for a mental disorder. Right. So, it's very so that's common. almost 20 percent. Yes indeed, yes indeed. Uh, there is a perception that it is uh, mental illness is uh, happening only in adults and not in children. Is that a wrong perception? Yes, we certainly can identify mental disorders in children as well. Mm -hmm. The types of mental disorders that we tend to see in childhood are a little bit different to the ones that we, we tend to see in adulthood. Right. There is a little bit of continuity, but 
In children we see much more anxiety, phobias, behavioural disturbances, um, but we can see depression, we can see severe anxiety, yeah, yeah. very rarely we can see psychosis such as schizophrenia coming on in childhood. Mm -hmm. So it should be taken seriously if children do appear to be manifesting symptoms of, of psychological distress or disorder. Does uh, heredity play a part, Doctor? Yes, it does. Um, heredity certainly plays a part um, in probably most mental disorders, in fact. Right. So we know that if you have a family member who's had uh, illnesses of certain types, um, then there is, you yourself will be at an increased risk. And that, that seems to be the case for most types of mental disorder. And there's a little bit of what we call um, well, there's a little bit of specificity in that if there is schizophrenia, say, in your family, then you have a, a slightly increased risk of schizophrenia and depression and anxiety for depression and anxiety, for example. So it does seem to be a little bit that specific there in terms of inheritance. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of uh, two different types, psychosis and neurosis, in terms of mm -hmm. defining the mental illness. Uh, which is more common, you think? Oh, neurosis is much more common, hands down. Mm -hmm. We don't really use that term anymore. Right. And one of the reasons that we don't is I think it took on some negative connotations. I think there's a tendency to, to sort of think, oh, neurosis, you know, they're just being a bit weak or, you know, it's all in their mind. So that's probably one of the reasons we've moved away from that term because it implies that people are bringing it on themselves yeah. and just failing to fix it. But neurosis... Um, by which we include things like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, um, are by far the most common. Psychosis probably accounts for only really one to two percent oh, of okay. mental illnesses. Uh, does uh, anxiety the starting point for uh, that can lead to depression? It can, mm. but it doesn't have to. You can get depressed because you've got the um, genetic tendency to it. You can get depressed as a result of life experiences, things that, that happen to you. Mm -hmm. There's really a, a, a complexity between your personality style, your upbringing, your experiences that can increase your, your risk of depression. Um, anxiety can lead to depression, mm -hmm. uh, but often when that's the case, it's, it's because people feel depressed about being so anxious. And anxiety actually probably has a stronger genetic component. Right, right. And of course we have heard of um, drugs and alcohol uh, influencing the youth uh, in terms of, and also adults of course. Uh, how widespread and how serious is that problem? Well it's a significant problem and not just among youth. Mm -hmm. So again the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing estimated that 5% of the population have a substance use problem. Oh, okay. So that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think what's often overlooked is in fact, by far the most commonly abused drug is alcohol. The, the uh, most widely used um, substance that causes problems with mental health is alcohol. And alcohol is often a starting point for other drugs if particularly young people are going to move on to use other drugs. Mm -hmm. So we know that the earlier that people use alcohol in their lives, the more at risk they are of right. moving on to use other drugs and of developing alcohol-related problems. So I think the key point is if you have a mental illness, drugs and alcohol are going to exacerbate that and interfere with recovery. There is also some evidence, for example, with cannabis that it may contribute to the risk of developing psychosis. All right. Um, doctor, I was talking to my GP the other day and uh, he was saying that uh, uh, nearly 50 to 60 percent of the patients who come to him with uh, physical illness, complaining of physical illness, are in fact su suffering from mental disorder. Do, would you agree with him? Well, he's a very wise GP, I think. <laughs> um, most research suggests that probably 30 percent of general practice attenders also have a psychological problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, some GPs are very attuned to it and I think they might attract more people with mm -hmm. that problem because they're aware they'll get a sympathetic hearing. There's, there's no doubt that some GPs have a particular interest in, in mental illness and its treatment and probably are very good at 
enabling patients to, to talk about that. But I think there's a very important overlap between physical health and mental health mm -hmm. that is often overlooked. There is a perception, Doctor, that uh, some of the, it is more widespread amongst the migrant communities, basically because they, there's a cultural change when they come from one culture to another, there is that cultural shock which can impact on their uh, anxiety problems and others if they are prone to it. Uh, have you seen in your career that kind of uh, uh, prevalence in amongst migrant communities? Well, there is some research that supports that uh, mental illness may be more common in migrant communities. And as you say, there's, there's a lot of factors that are involved. Um, I think whether it's more common in my you know, personal clinical practice um, I'm not sure because I guess I already see the people that are ill mm. and it's hard to say, you know, what proportion of the community is that. But certainly there are risks mm. to being a migrant, particularly if you've left your family behind, yes. particularly if you've migrated because of hardships that have already trauma. occurred, trauma mm. and so forth, and uh, particularly if your path when you arrive here is isolated yeah. um, or it's difficult to integrate. Uh, so I think the things... The thing is that migrants often face a lot more challenges um, which, which put them at risk. Right. And uh, of course, as they say, a stitch in time saves nine. They, are there any telltale signs which we can deduct early in the piece to address these uh, anxiety and depression problems? Yeah, look, I think, I think there are. I think mm -hmm. basically people need to not kind of sweep it under the carpet if they're not feeling their usual self. Mm -hmm. Often the people that know them best will comment. They will notice that for some time now, the person just hasn't been their usual self. Key symptoms are social withdrawal. That's probably one of the most important symptoms. When people start to feel like pulling away from other people and isolating themselves. And that's a really important sign because it can actually make the illness worse, of course, yes. because maintaining social contact is such a protective factor but it's often a sign mm -hmm. that people are, are not well. Sleep disturbance is, is often an early sign, but perhaps it's so common already that it may not be as good a sign if you know what I mean. But if you're normally a good sleeper and suddenly you start waking frequently through the night or mm -hmm. having significant problems getting to sleep and that doesn't settle down, then that could be an important sign. Disturbance of your physical functioning, losing your appetite, suddenly feeling fatigued all the time and having no energy. I'm um, finding that your mind is going round in circles and you're worrying about things a lot more or feeling quite negative about things. When those symptoms are sustained, when they're not just a few days or it's not just because something upsetting happened, but it seems to be going on and on, it's getting harder to do things in your life, then really you should go and see your GP and talk mm -hmm. about it because you're absolutely right. Recognising these things early and treating them before they potentially become more severe is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Well, there is this social stigma attached to it and also uh, the other impacts like your employment and other things as well. So people don't come forward readily to accept that they have a problem. W what kind of advice would you like to give them? Well, I think that is changing slowly. Mm -hmm. And I would say in my practice now, I'm hearing more and more good news stories mm -hmm about employers who understand right. because they themselves have had mental illness, they've had depression or anxiety or, or even um, psychosis or bipolar disorder and they really understand. I think that high profile people are coming forward mm -hmm. more and more and talking about their own issues and illnesses mm -hmm. and often they've had quite serious mental illnesses as well and they're able to, to talk about those. So I agree with you that unfortunately there is still a stigma, but I think the good news is that that is, is slowly changing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes too, when people are in a negative frame of mind, I think they imagine that other people's reactions are going to be worse than they actually are. And so I think the first step might be sharing it with someone close to you, um, sharing it with someone you can confide in, even a friend outside your family. I mean, your family probably often already know, mm -hmm. although they're the first people that yes. is good to talk to. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've had the chance of uh, taking one of your books, uh, Doctor, Take Control of Your Worry. It's fascinating. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, this work and also the other work that you have done? At the time, I was working in private practice and I was treating a lot of people who were spending so much of their time worrying that they were really feeling that their quality of life was being impacted. And they knew that their worry was out of proportion to what was reasonable. 
But in addition to their worry, they were fatigued, they weren't sleeping, they weren't enjoying their life. And I realised there didn't seem to be any self-help resources out there. Um, so as you may know, I've had a long-standing interest in anxiety and I've seen a lot of people with anxiety over the years who taught me a lot mm -hmm. about how to help other people okay. with anxiety. Right. And so I was writing little handouts for people and I thought, why not put it all in a book? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of other kind of books I can mention. Yeah, please. Yeah. But, um, I really like this book. This yeah, is by yeah. Tim different. Sharp, which is called The Happiness Handbook. Oh, okay. And this is not so much for necessarily if you have depression at the level of disorder, but it's just really good advice for keeping ourselves healthy. Because as you said, this is a mental well-being yes. program. Oh, this is about how to maintain your mental well-being and also how to increase your resilience, mm. how to have a bit more protection against life's knocks mm. and upsets. So yes. I like that book. This is a book that came out recently called The Mindful Way Through Depression, right. which incorporates mindfulness techniques right. for managing depression. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, meditation is something that's been around for a very long time. <laughs> going to ask and to you. some extent, Westerners have only just discovered it, you know. <laughs> um, but it's been incorporated now into some strategies that people can use to help themselves through depression. Mm -hmm. And I might add, very useful for anxiety as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another useful book. And there's also, um, this is actually a publication that's been developed by the area health service that I work for, okay. Uncharted Water. So it's, it's available through community clinics. It's okay. a free publication. And it's also got a lot of advice and information for carers. Because I think carers are often neglected right. uh, in, in mental illness and they provide such an important role mm. that we mustn't overlook carers yes. either. So mm. now I must say these are only a selection that I grabbed off my bookshelf. There's many good books mm. out there that people may find useful and I think that's a good thing these days. There's a lot of resources available. Yes. Thank you very much doctor and of course you mentioned about the eastern uh, ways, uh, the good old uh, uh, meditative techniques and yoga and meditation and all that. What's your view on that? Um, I think they can play an important part for people. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we use a stepped model now, if you like. So when we see someone, we decide how, what type of problem do they have? How severe is it? Do they need medication? Or is their type and severity of illness such that we can really manage it without using medication? So mindfulness strategies, I think, have an important role to play. Uh, particularly in people who have chronic symptoms, although there is some emerging evidence of their acute use as well. Right. When you've had a lot of anxiety and depression, you can get so caught up in your own symptoms that that becomes part of the problem. Right. So I think various types of meditational strategies mm -hmm. have an important role to play. And right. I think it's important to reassure people. Sometimes people think, oh, I don't know, that's a bit, <laughs> you know, yeah. is it some sort of religion? that it doesn't have to be. I yeah. mean, yoga, as you know, is a physical type of meditation. Yeah. And um, mindfulness meditation, you don't have to be an expert at it. As I say to my patients, it's the practice that actually creates the benefit. Yes. It's, yes. it's the trying to do it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think they can play a really important mm. role. Yeah, in fact, uh, every time I mention meditation to anyone, uh, because I do practice meditation and yeah. then uh, they say that, uh, you know, it's a religious thing and I have nothing to do with it. I keep telling them it's like taking an aspirin when you feel a uh, bit of flu. <laughs> well, you know, I think it actually should be part of all our lives probably. Yes. You know, it's something that we do to help us stay well and exercise too. Mm. So there are some strategies that w we all need to stay healthy. Mm. And, you know, you said a stitch in time and I think the other thing to say is prevention is better than cure. Yeah. So to the extent that we can keep ourselves psychologically well and happy, we should be doing those mm. things. So yes, I think meditation, everybody could find a form of meditation that they would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Lampy, thanks for talking to Aussie India. My pleasure, thank you.